This is Dominic, and he has a pretty impressive resume. He created Inferno.js, he is a former core team engineer at React, and he is a core maintainer of Svelte.js. He is also employed by Vercel, but you shouldn't hold that against him. Based on his resume, I think it's fair to say that Dominic's work pushed the entire web dev forward, and he is probably one of the few people who can actually build yet another front-end framework in good faith. No! God, please, no! No! Since he was involved in some of the most popular tools web devs are using, he got the chance to learn what works and what doesn't. So Dominic spent a week combining all the best features modern JS frameworks have to offer, and the result is a TypeScript-first UI framework called Ripple. Don't worry, this is not a video hyping yet another front-end framework you'll never actually get the chance to work with. We are all probably stuck in a depressing React or Angular world anyway, but looking at Ripple is important because it gives us the chance to understand what the future of web dev could look like. So let's spend the next few minutes reviewing Ripple's most important features and concepts. What's interesting is that Ripple was designed to be a TypeScript-first framework rather than HTML-first. This has a few interesting implications we'll discuss when we look at some code examples. Ripple modules also have their own extension, and these modules fully support TypeScript. Frameworks like Astro, Vue, and Svelte all have their own extensions which bundle markup, logic, and styles together. This might be a questionable decision for some separation of concern purists, but it does have practical benefits. By having its own custom extension, a framework can define a superset language that integrates tightly with TypeScript, and it can provide better developer tools and IDE support. Next, just like in any other modern JS framework, the reusable component is the main building block of your application. However, Ripple introduces a couple of novel concepts here. First, developers can use the component keyword to declare these elements. Components are similar to functions in that they have props, but crucially, they allow for a JSX-like syntax to be defined alongside standard TypeScript. That means you do not return JSX like in other frameworks, but you instead use it like a JavaScript statement. On top of that, the Ripple templates also support shorthands and object spreads. However, the reactivity system is where Ripple really shines. Of course, these days, most modern frameworks, except good old React, are built on top of the Signals architecture introduced in WebDev through Knockout.js observables and made popular in recent years by SolidJS. But if you worked with Signals, you are probably familiar with the small caveat of having to always unwrap them using a function call. This causes your accessing and setting statements to be a bit more verbose than they should be. Ripple tries to address this by letting you read and write signals in a friendlier manner. The track function will create a boxed object that is not accessible from the outside, so you must use the ampersand notation to unbox it and to read or write its underlying value. Of course, you can pass these tracked objects between components, functions, and context to read and write to the value in different parts of your codebase. As a quick side note, seamless reactivity was one of the main promises of Svelte for a long while until Svelte 5 and Runes came along. Some of you might know that the decision to move away from implicit reactivity in Svelte 5 started an interesting debate. Runes make reactivity more explicit and powerful, but at the cost of some added ceremony. Ripple's reactivity combines the best of both worlds, but before looking at it in more detail, please let me tell you a few words about today's sponsor. Savala is an all-in-one, no-friction platform as a service for deploying anything ranging from interactive apps to databases or static sites, offering cloud-native performance and a seamless dev experience with advanced deployment pipelines, instant preview for apps or static websites, and one-click deploy templates to accelerate your development process. Under the hood, Savala is leveraging Google Kubernetes Engine across 25 regions, and thanks to Cloudflare's Edge Network integration, your static content is globally optimized for speed. Check out the link in the description and you can get started for free with a $50 credit, no hidden fees and predictable payments. Back to Ripple, note that the track function offers optional get and set parameters that let you customize how a tracked value is read or written, similar to property accessors but expressed as pure functions. The framework also extends reactivity to collections in a really neat way. Arrays, sets and maps all get their own reactive variants. For instance, a Ripple array works just like a normal JavaScript array, but it tracks updates and exposes length as a reactive property. What's more interesting is that Ripple has built-in support for dynamic components, so you can render different components based on reactive state. Instead of hard-coding which component to show, you can store a component in a tracked object and update it at runtime. When the tracked value changes, Ripple automatically unmounts the previous component and mounts the new one. Dynamic components are written with a special tag, where the ampersand both unwraps the tracked reference and tells the compiler that the component is dynamic. 
This makes it straightforward to pass components as props or swap them directly within a component, enabling flexible, state-driven UIs with minimal boilerplate. Of course, this fine-grained reactivity leads to an industry-leading performance and memory usage. Remember that prior to signal reactivity, the most common way to detect changes in the DOM was through diffing algorithms and some sort of virtual DOM construct. So, in older approaches, frameworks had to look at these constructs, compare them when various events were triggered, and then patch the real DOM where needed. For a long while this was the status quo, but it is an expensive and complex process. Fine-grained reactivity, on the other hand, doesn't waste time checking things that didn't change. It knows exactly which part of your state has been updated and can surgically update only the places that depend on it. That's why frameworks like Solid or Quick feel snappy and Ripple is built on the same principle but tries to make the developer experience even smoother. Back to the code, when dealing with reactive state, a very common requirement is to create side effects based on changes that happen upon updates. Ripple follows the most established pattern here and it exposes an effect function that looks and feels just like you'd expect. And these effects can be nested and composed without special rules. Compare this with React where you constantly worry about stale closures, cleanup functions, or accidentally firing effects too often. When it comes to control flow, Ripple is both simplifying things and forces you to unlearn some habits. The JSX-like syntax might feel familiar at first glance, but Ripple doesn't let you sprinkle templating everywhere like in React or Solid. Instead, you can only use it inside a component body. That means you won't be assigning JSX to variables or returning it from helper functions. At first, this feels restrictive, but it makes the boundary between logic and rendering crystal clear. Note that strings inside the template need to be inside curly braces, since Ripple has no idea if hello is a string or maybe some JavaScript code that needs evaluating. If blocks, on the other hand, work seamlessly with Ripple's templating language, since you can put them inside the JSX-like statements, making control flow far easier to read and reason with. Similarly, loops are expressed with for off, and Ripple extends the syntax with a built-in index label to capture the loop's position without extra bookkeeping. So you get the point. Ripple templates are a superset of JSX, which, let's be honest, might sound like the worst pitch you could give to a front-end developer in 2025. At the end of the day, templating is mostly a matter of preference these days, and if your background is in frameworks like Angular or Vue, I can understand if this approach feels messy. Of course, there are other things a framework needs, like scoped styling, event handling, or some sort of context mechanism to share state. Ripple borrows ideas from established solutions here and puts its own spin on them. And this brings us to the only important thing you need to know about front-end frameworks in 2025. I think it's safe to assume we finally got to a point where things feel stable and everybody agrees on the most important aspects. Components are the fundamental unit, fine-grained reactivity is the only sane way to manage state, side effects should be predictable, and TypeScript is a must. The differences now are in how these pieces are packaged and how much ceremony each framework forces you to go through. Ripple is an interesting exercise, not because it reinvents any of these core ideas, but because it summarizes all the lessons learned from the last decade of front-end chaos into one small package. So while you probably won't be rewriting your company's dashboard in Ripple anytime soon, it's worth keeping an eye on projects like this. As always, feel free to complain about web dev in the comments, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and until next time, thank you for watching.